One Friday night in fall 2003, I stared at a ladder collapsed and leaning against the front of a stranger's house in a neighborhood I didn't belong to. <laughs> Couldn't really make much else out. Just the ladder. And my punk hood rat friends standing next to me in the darkness, they volunteered me to take it. Saturday afternoon, the next day, was the first show for XWA, Extreme Wrestling Alliance. That's what we called our backyard wrestling league of children amateurly performing highly coordinated, highly dangerous flips and tosses on twin mattresses too deep and dirty <laughs> to sleep on. Extreme without the E. <laughs> so you know we weren't fucking around. I was a teenage backyard wrestler. A real professional wrestler would probably slap me in the mouth if they heard me claim what I did is what they do, even if they too started wrestling by roughhousing on trampolines. That's what backyard wrestling is, roughhousing. Rough play from rough kids picking up and dropping each other, defiant to any don't try this at home warnings that proceeded highly impressionable wrestling programs. We tried it at home. We tried it at neighbors' homes, in courtyards, on jungle gyms, in pools. XWA's main attraction was a ladder match in the main event. A ladder match is when a promoter hoists a pro wrestling MacGuffin above the ring high enough for a performer to need a ladder to retrieve. Most wrestling shows have like a contract or a briefcase dangling from a rope, a chain, a pulley over a beam, or in the rafters. We had a foam and plastic replica toy championship belt, and we had a tree to suspend it above the ground. We didn't have a ladder, and we needed a ladder, this ladder. You got it, bro. You're good, you're good, you're good. It's not even that heavy. We'll holler if they start coming out. I had ingratiated myself into a group who were staunchly serious about wrestling, even though by 2003, the industry had cooled off from the red hot late 90s. They had pooled money for premium programming, they blared wrestlers' entrance music on speakers like Top 40 Pop. Wet, sticky, crusty wrestling merchandise covered bedrooms and bathroom floors. <laughs> Opinions and insults coated in wrestling trivia were ceaselessly hurled at each other. Endless roasting. Endless shit talking. Dog, do you really think? <laughs> that Sean is better than Brett? <laughs> Sean can do more than, hey, has anyone heard about Brian Danielson? Sean Michaels trained him. He's really good. I downloaded one of his matches on Kazaa. <laughs> Shut the fuck up, OJ. <laughs> A lot of the shit talk was about me shit talk about my clothes, about the dumb things I elected to share with the group, about my opinions, about my body, about my personality. To be fair, I was awkward, annoying, practically begging for acceptance. More fair to this band of jerks, I was new. New guy always gets the most shit. And to be fair to myself, <laughs> I was a phony, a fake, a tourist. XWA kids were punks, burnouts, problem children from dysfunctional homes with lax authority figures. They may have had other interests in wrestling and debauchery, but not many. Their academic acumen spanned from pretty decent to piss poor. <laughs> they smoked cigarettes, they drank. 
They smoked other things. <laughs> they drank some more. They were the kind of feral pack that band geeks and theater kids whispered about. <laughs> Do you hear it? Jessica got alcohol poisoning. <laughs> yeah, I was there. <laughs> what happened to her? I don't know. <laughs> These kids had just enough friends that were just adult enough to get the illicit things they wanted without it being weird. <laughs> These kids stole from Walmart constantly. They had cars, they had girlfriends, they had boyfriends, they had romantic partners. I was pretty sure they were only wit because those partners had cars. They dated each other. They had loud, obnoxious teen sex with each other in trash-filled spare bedrooms, shamelessly in earshot of everyone else in the living room. They broke up often. <laughs> Drama was constant. <laughs> and they also wrestled in cluttered living rooms and barren backyards. All but one of those activities absolutely terrified me. No, no, no. I say they, not to differentiate, but to distinguish. While I was also obsessed over wrestling, while the group was primarily black kids, while we were all steeped in the minutia of pop punk, new metal, and other suburban monoculture, that's all we shared. I was a good kid, good at school, good at church. Being a good kid mostly meant I wasn't in trouble. I liked not being in trouble. Parents with multiple children, multiple divorces, multiple jobs, multiple bills, fees, and responsibilities, they like less trouble, too. Good kids could do things that parents wouldn't approve of. But it was more like, don't ask, don't tell, don't disclose. I also liked this group of kids. They were so different from me. Fearless, unfiltered, hilarious, honest. A social group more harrowing than my anime club, math lead, and other nuttier cohorts, the XWA's crew had a, a dysfunctional charm. I was no better than those kids, just better off. That 2003 Fall Friday night, inching closer across the foreign soil of an unfamiliar front yard, my only thought was to not get caught, not getting the cops called on me, not getting my parents or pastor involved. <laughs> None of them then could pre prevent it, this trifling ass behavior or presage future falls from grace. None of them could help me pick up this ladder. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't calculate what would happen once I procured said ladder. I guess I imagined that after I removed the ladder from the side of the building and slunk it to the street, a co-conspirator would help me slowly and efficiently whisk it away to our headquarters. <laughs> the tilt, the infamous kind of house that would enable such juvenile lawlessness was about a block away. By the time I touched the ladder, picked it up, felt that the awkward oblong shape constricted my muscles and that the heft weighed me down. By the time I looked back at my friends, they were gone. The footstep patter of their Converse All-Stars on concrete and their giggles receded into the still autumn darkness. My backyard wrestling moniker was Jimmy Payne. P-A-Y-N-E. Jimmy from James, one of my middle names. And pain because I was constantly in it. <laughs> it said that the best wrestling characters are the performer's truest self turned up to 11. And my truth is that I'm sad, sensitive, introverted, isolated. 
By high school, my as yet undiagnosed, untreated clinical manic depression was ravenous. Depression was and remains my biggest rival. Mania, at the time, manifested in my need for everyone to see me, to hear me, to feel me, to validate me. Few, are under, few understood or even recognized that energy. Adults couldn't clock it. Kids couldn't stand it. Most found me being a perpetually aggrieved, self-martyring attention whore rather annoying. <laughs> Younger me found solace engaging in the physicality and creativity wrestling manifests for its participants. There's two beautiful realities of existing in wrestling. One, you gotta get a gimmick. You need to fabricate a backstory or a character, some essence for being. And two, that it's going to hurt. Pain's non-negotiable. One ugly truth is to do wrestling, you need other people. People who can focus on themselves and their own expression to succeed. People who can hurt you, really hurt you. XWA allowed me to redefine my own narrative and offer a perverse indulgence in the harm of being thrown on the ground. I fashioned myself as a Mick Foley or a Terry Funk type, the kind of wrestler who could take a beating, get tossed around, sacrifice their body to hard landings and make their opponent look godly in the process. Interpretive dance of simulated brutality on a squared circle of dirt. Backyard wrestling was my inside paid made outward, performed outdoors, while feeling like an outsider of the outsiders. And let me tell you something. Jimmy Payne took pride in his ability to tolerate his namesake, to push through with technique and honor and will. No friends, no heroes, no masters, just me. Just me. And did I have Pain by Jimmy Eat World as my walkout music? You better believe it. So I ran. I was my first time stealing a ladder, my first time running full speed with a ladder. The clunky, clattering plate steel that pressed against my body rubbed me the wrong way. I was pissed and embarrassed and exhilarated. Blood pumped, blood boiled. My God, I had forsaken my God. Forsaken my God, my values, and my upbringing for a fucking ladder. <laughs> and I had gotten away with it. Surely there were kudos when I arrived back at the tilt, but not nearly enough to assuage my inner turmoil. I was deathly afraid that the cops would raid us at any minute. <laughs> but I didn't care. I just wanted to wrestle and watch my friends wrestle. And we had what we needed for the main event. Are you ready for the main event? Well, on one side, we had Melvin. I sincerely think Melvin could have been a great professional wrestler. He was a bit smaller, felt, which would have been hard to uh, navigate in an industry full of giants, but he had agility and coordination and fluidity to pull off amazing choreography with elegant naturalism. Our other competitor in the main event, Steve. Steve was just a guy. Cool guy, a little older than us. He had a car. He was tall and sturdy, so he could pick the smaller Melvin up and help him do flips. So they're wrestling, and they're wrestling, and they're wrestling, and weirdly there's a crowd, and the classmates from the neighborhood were there. It's like a real show. It's really cool. And wrestling, and wrestling, and oh, this is getting good. It's no Jeff Hardy versus The Undertaker, but crack! Oh, said the crowd. Ten minutes into the match, Melvin threw the ladder. My ladder. 
Steve, on the other end of the flying mesh of steel, was supposed to put his hands up. He didn't. After the collision, Steve stumbled in the yard on noodle legs. Wait, what's that? Is that blood? Oh shit, Steve was bleeding, bad, busted open, hard way. The wound above his eye erupted. Blood projected out long and shiny and thick like Twizzlers. It was like his eye was gleeking. Over and over. If you're trying to convince someone that intelligence could be measured in the amount of blood your body pumps to your head, our friend would look like a genius. But he clearly wasn't. Nothing looks dumber than a teenager bleeding profusely after being hit with a ladder he rehearsed to have thrown at him. Blood was getting everywhere. Fast, on the concrete, on the dry dead yard. Continue the match? No, stop the match. Get a towel, call an ambulance. That's it, everybody leave, this is over. Our bloody friend had a concussion. Somebody convinced the EMTs that they could drive him to the emergency room as to avoid an ambulance ride none of us could afford. I was nervous the medics would ask about the ladder. <laughs> the tool of destruction, as if they were cops. The guardian of the home, who was fine with the show thus far and permitted our reckless youth in general, declared that wrestling at her house was done. We'd have two more shows after things cooled down. Those shows were less exciting. Nobody got maimed. That was OJ Patterson. <laughs>